uh, my remarks this morning draw on the philosophy of communication and the history of philosophy of science to weigh in on memory as history and self. I'm a communication uh, researcher standing before uh, literary scholars, but all of us research media, which have a similar purpose of information storage and storytelling, and all our research objects are now translated into one medium, digital information. It is this new ground that I want to engage today by taking a long history approach to media and self. In both literary and communication scholarships, we study the content of media as representations. However, communication technologies have never been about mere representation, mediation, and the transmission of information. Whatever they aim to store is not just traces, copies, documentations, and memories, nor are they mere extensions of the self, as suggested by English literature professor turned media scholar Marshall McLuhan. Media have always been about capturing the self, becoming containers of our very essence, and then transmitting and sustaining these livelihoods across time and space. These memories carried over media are not just history or his story, but an attempt at his storage, or hers, of course. This is at the root of the confusion between the self and its representation, identity and memory, story and experience. So the story I want to tell you today is how the very worldly concept of a communication medium is in fact born out of a dream of transcending materiality. In the second part of my talk, I shall point to some narrative trends in popular science fiction, popular culture, and everyday life which result from that. So the story of media and the self begins with Saint Augustine of Hippo, a Christian theologian and scholar of the third century, who helped build both the idea of an interior self and the dream of overcoming it in the process of communication. For Augustine, communication meant a meeting of interiors, establishing some identity between two souls. And this happens best when bodies and language are transcendent in favor of more ethereal modes of thought transference. Augustine may have invented the concept of a medium through his perceptions of signs as passive vessels able to contain the spirit just like bodies. The word, like the human being believed at the time, sorry, using the wrong one, uh, perce uh, was perceived as part matter, part sound. So the spirit, uh, the sound is the matter, the spirit is the meaning. A word made flesh, he called it, bearing the responsibility of revealing our interiors. As a medium, speech captures the soul's interiors in order to be shared, and it captures it alive because it shares body space with it. It is literally part of it. Writing, however, the first external communication technology, presented a challenge. This is when the notion of a mere representation presents itself. And what sets it apart from the authentic original is its lack of spirit. Can the spirit technically occupy the space of the written letter as it did the embodied spoken word? Perhaps the letter did not entirely kill it the soul, though. Perhaps it is merely delivered in a zombie state, since the reader's interface of imagination is able to revive it and give it meaning in another soul's interior. So Augustine's ideal of soul-to-soul -soul communication and communion might still occur even in writing. The image presents an opportunity for a superior capture ab capturing ability. In early human history, we know this, that the image was understood to be loaded with occult powers that allowed for direct interaction with the gods by containing some of their actual presence and power. Against this backdrop, it made sense that the early medium of painting was attempting to equally capture the essence of the human being. And again, capture, not represent. The earliest portraits we know of are the Fayum portraits painted around the same time of Augustine in ancient Egypt. These strikingly realistic portraits were painted on mummies and sometimes separately for the home. And according to art historian Zenia Gershman, the paintings were designed as a kind of a soul catcher. Once the soul recognizes itself in this mirror, it will jump into the painting. So this way the deceased family could have their loved ones around after death, and this is how they actually treated these paintings as an actual continued presence in the house. Now, in the case of the image of representation, isn't the form devoid of spirit, it simply is a partial capture, which could be enough for certain purposes. Partial capture isn't enough for the angry perfectionist Hebrew god that wanted us to have unmediated content with its abstract wholeness, 
that male representations of other humans seem more than enough for us to claim authentic knowledge of and even give power of our lives to without demanding to meet in person the people we vote for, for example. In order for communication technologies to fulfill Augustine's ideal, they need to overcome, translate, to transcend by means of erasure, time, space, bodies, and even the medium's own materiality. Now this is a crucial point to understand. The media are born into a suicide mission, which is their purpose and nature. They need to appear transparent and disappear every obstacle to soul-to-soul -soul transference. So a good medium is a dead medium. A good enough medium simply pretends not to be there. And that's why buttons tend to disappear from the newest versions of our phones, game consoles turn to kinesthetic interfaces, and movies move, move from three to four to seven dimensions. So everything could happen by magic as if the media are not there and we are experiencing reality directly. Electricity was a game changer for the soul, especially after it was discovered that the human body is a conductor of it. Electricity not only could restore the livelihood of the spirit carried by the sign, but may as well be the substance of the soul. I assume this forum is quite familiar with the vitalist perceptions of electricity in the 19th century, but here is a more recent art articulation of it by a Western Buddhist scholar. Do we really know what electricity is? By knowing the laws according to which it acts and by making use of them, we still do not know the origin or the real nature of this force which ultimately may be the very source of life, light, and consciousness, the divine power and mover of all that exists. The Victorian era telegraph was the first global mass medium powered by electricity. For the first time, communication surpassed the speed of transportation, producing a medium that is claimed to erase space or collapse time and space. In his work on the telegraph and spiritualism, media historian Jeremy Stolo argues that under these circumstances, it was reasonable for people to assume that electronic communication is also capable of facilitating communication with the dead. After all, Ouija boards operated like telegraphs, and the word medium referred both to the technology involved and the women who facilitated, literally channeled, the communication. Since electricity was believed to be the stuff of life, it made sense that selves could be best captured by the media it powered. Philosopher of communication John Durham Peters writes in his seminal book, Speaking into the Air, with telegraphy came new opportunities and new expectations for sustaining one's presence in an autonomous, ethereal world of electrical currents and flows. This was a universe into which human bodies covered in flesh, impaired by weak sensory organs prone to fatigue and slow to move, could never really enter. To the extent that electrical media were capable of duplicating and distributing human presences in this ethereal world of information exchange, the very terms of human communication had been forever changed. To interact with others now meant to read the traces of their virtual presence. From here on, the trajectory of media technologies could be viewed as a process of cutting humans into pieces, swallowing them whole, and spitting them out at will anywhere, anytime. The phonograph and the radio were successful in separating the voice from the body so it could provide other souls with another human's warm touch from a distance, be it distant space or a distant time. And finally, the cinema and television captured our entire bodily presence and allowed us to appear in person apart from flesh. The repetitive replicabil replicability and ubiquity of still and moving images today has perhaps diluted the livelihood of these captured spirit or merely erased our awareness of its presence. Critical theorists like Walter Benjamin and Theodore Adorno lingered over the mechanics of that erasure a century ago. As a result, all those selfies we take nowadays, although becoming an integral part of our experience, are still treated as mere representations, performances, memories, but perhaps the indigenous people who refuse to have their picture taken in fear of losing a piece of their souls know better the nature of the beast, remember what media are actually about. The ancient Greek considered memory as a faculty of the soul. In the transition from the Greek concept of the soul to the secularized Western self, memory is what survived as the substance of identity. Memory was a crucial part of the ability to learn and is what separated us from machines according to Descartes. However, the cybernetic revolution of the 20th century enabled the creation of media that can remember and act upon that memory as well. And by being more like us, 
digital machines got the closest yet to capturing us. The premise of Norbert Wiener's cybernetics is the metaphor of the organism as a message, treating humans as information. Now I apologize for these two long quotes that I'm gonna bring from Wiener's uh, 1950 book, The Human Use of Human Beings, but his speculative chapter, chapter five, became hard science for a lot of sciences today, so we need to understand this suggestion properly. Our tissues change as we live. The food we eat and the air we breathe become flesh of our flesh and bone of our bone, and the momentary elements of our flesh and bone pass out of our body every day with our exerta. We are but weird pools in a river of ever-flowing water. We're not stuff that abides, but patterns that perpetuate themselves. Now we now know in biology that all, our, all the cells in our body are completely replaced in the course of eight years. So I do not share a single biological cell with 15 years old me. Nothing biological connects 15 years old Carmel to current me. So the perpetual patterns we call memories perhaps today are all that sustain this continuity. And this becomes clear in the plethora of science fiction memory loss narratives, which often produce completely different moral agency when memory is rebooted. Last quote, a pattern is a message and may be transmitted as a message. How else do we employ our radio than to transmit patterns of sound and our television set than to transmit patterns of light? It is amusing as well as instructive to consider what would happen if we were to transmit the whole pattern of the human body, of the human brain with its memories and cross connections, so that a hypothetical receiving instrument could re-embody these messages in appropriate matter, capable of continuing the processes already in the body and the mind, and of maintaining the integrity needed for this continuation. So Professor Catherine Hales famously critiqued Wiener for understanding people as patterns of data rather than corporeal beings. She thought this perception of information was dichotomous to embodiment and mapped the Carthusian dualist perception, body and mind. But for cybernetic scholar Gregory Bateson, consciousness is actually connected to the body. It's an emergent property of matter, a production of the many feedback loops of the environment. So the soul is embodied, and at the same time capable of extending beyond its boundaries, flirting through feedback loops with other systems. This is precisely what gives us a sense of presence on the internet, for example. However, if this soul didn't exist prior to the body, according to Bateson, how can it aim to outlast it based on an interpretation of Wiener? This paradox haunted me for a while until I realized an important difference. Cybernetics does not discuss the separation of body and information. It aims solely for replicating patterns. We're talking about imitation in the Turing sense of the imitation game. A good enough performance of you is indistinguishable from you. This is in line with the dominance of the performative approach to identity these days. It's something that you do other than you are. In this quote from Wiener, we see that the pattern is replicated, copied, and transmitted but not actually transferred in the physical sense. It's not like beam me up Scotty, as Hale suggested, but more like kill Scotty and reprint him on the other side with a 3D printer every single time. <laughs> the copy on the other side is not the original you, like the paper coming out of the fax machine is not the same paper sent from the other side. It's after all a media approach to humans. And from this perspective, this isn't a dualist perception as it is a holistic theory, suggesting a far worse reductionism of everything into information patterns. These vague probabilities, or functional terms, information patterns, apply equally to every type of matter. And it does not simply treat the body as another medium, the body is now part of the message. Cybernetics was the first scientific basis for the creation of new media ones in which the content could be separated post factum from the materiality of the medium and travel into, different, in, into a different medium, intact. After a film was recorded or a newspaper was printed, there's no way to separate the content from the tape or the paper anymore. But the electronic signals of digital information circulate freely between different media. And this marvel is achieved through numeric representation. Every other material proved irresistible and irresistibly translatable to numbers. Numbers like letters are merely a representational system. Even Norbert Wiener, who was a mathematician, referred to math as the most successful metaphor ever. 
yet it is a metaphor we live by, which recently seems to be acquiring ontological status as the substance of life. If the postmodern is about the precedence of language to the body, then the posthuman is perhaps about the precedence of numbers to reality, be it zeros and ones or just 42. It is a vast topic I dare not go into in length, but in modern physics, digital philosophy is a mainstream theory today, promoted by people such as Edward Fredkin and Stephen Wolfram, arguing the universe is basically a form of virtual reality. The very materiality of what we call material is being challenged, and in this new relational world, representation is the new ontology. Mathematical equations are the blueprint for organic matter. For example, the Blue, Blue Brain EU project aims at replicating a human brain by simply building a mathematical computer simulation of a full brain activity. In short, reality has lost Turing's imitation game, but to a mathematical, not a linguistic copy of it. Numbers are the medium that is now the message. According to physics scholar and popular science writer Margaret Wertheim, this attitude invokes an even more ancient Greek idea. Pythagoras formulated a philosophy of nature in which the true essence of reality lies in the immaterial realm of numbers. Numbers were literally gods he associated with the Greek pantheon. For Pythagoras, the soul was too essentially mathematical. Its ability to express things rationally, literally in terms of ratio, was its primary characteristic. Mathematics was part of his religious practice to help free the soul from the shackles of the flesh so it can ascend and visit the numbers realms as soon as possible, as often as possible. So I wonder if spending lots of time online qualifies. Mm -hmm. Whatever is downloaded into computers today is expressed in numbers, particularly the numbers one and zero. The number one associated with the sun god Apollo was the most important and all encompassing for Pythagoras. So behind the cybernetic dream of human transmission and mind uploading through mathematical simulations is a deeply Pythagorean attitude where the soul's true home is the domain of data. Science fiction writers like Philip K. Dick were deeply inspired by these cybernetic notions. And contemporary science fiction movies and TV series based on that generation's legacy take the plasticity of the human as information patterns for granted. Selves or consciousness in the form of memories are transferable between organic and inorganic matters, uh, up, uh, able to embody various inanimate objects from houses to spaceships and naturally computer networks. Just like new media converged former media by cannibalizing their diverse materialities, they now aim at digitizing all organic entities. Emotions, memories, awareness, life, whatever different modalities they might have, chemical or electrical or biological, are assumed to be translatable to numeric representations just like sound, image, and writing work. In our popular science fiction narratives of machines becoming suddenly self-aware, such faculties are visually represented in terms of access to restricted information or receiving additional information in the form of rogue code or virus. What separates a, a, a life from death, machines from humans, is not different stuff that abides, but just a few bits of information. And I've compiled for you just uh, a few minutes from one of them is from Westworld, when Maeve gets awareness by the me visual metaphor of more access, and a minute from um, humans, in which uh, all the machines awake just by getting a virus. So let's see that moment. It's visually represented as more information, access to more information. Or we get a virus, we get a piece of code, and suddenly we are aware. Feelings, flexibility. So um, what contemporary media cannot capture yet, they simply pretend to. One of the forms this has taken in science fiction as well as popular culture and everyday life is the process in which cutting edge animation technologies and AI algorithms combine in order to organize digital traces and memories into a coherent simulation of the self, suggesting we treat these performances of this representation as ontology. The awarded TV series Black Mirror doesn't define itself as science fiction, but as depicting a world we are at the threshold of, 
merely a step away. Some of its episodes have already materialized into culture one way or another. In this first episode of the second season, titled Be Right Back, an AI algorithm given access to information left by the deceased online provides a, a comf comforting service to his widow by imitating the discursive style of the deceased, first in a written chat, then in his actual voice compiled through access to audio files, and finally as Frankenstein's monster, embodied in an artificial flesh. Although the deceased was painfully inattentive and her new husband aimed to please her, the grieving widow confronts him in the episode's climax. You're just a few ripples of you. There's no history to you. You're just a performance of stuff that he performed without thinking, and it's not enough. She cannot bring herself to get rid of this very expensive piece of memory tech, but she realizes ultimately that with all its sophistication, it is no more than a memory that even an animated, smartly curated collection of memories cannot suffice for identity. This powerful conclusion is delivered through the last scene, spoiler alert, in which this technological creature continues to live in her attic alongside the boxes of old family pictures as just another memory, dwelling where memories belong rather than among the living. I'm sure everyone in this room knows at least one person who is not alive anymore, but his or her social media profile and other online data are still up. These have been, uh, this has been a major issue in my field of digital culture for the past few years. People noted practicing of, practices of grieving first. It was interesting to see people talking to the deceased in first person through their old Facebook page in a way that resonated to the attempt to channel the dead through the telegraph. And we see here. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg channeling Steve Jobs, for example. One of my favorite papers on such practices is titled, There is no Wi-Fi in Heaven. Later, the fate of this data itself was, negotiating, was negotiated. It is now framed as digital legacy, debated in terms of property or memories akin to photos and letters we leave behind. One of the most interesting questions raised is if the right to privacy extends beyond the grave beyond the limits of one's identity, which is still understood as embodied in our codes of law. But something more, much more interesting is happening too. More and more people start treating this data as identity pieces, bits of one's soul. When Facebook denied access to family members of a deceased user, they often said to the media things like, I felt like I lost him all over again. John Jacobs, is but one example of many people who build, animate, and sustain an avatar for their deceased loved ones in a virtual reality environment or a video game where they can still pretend to spend time with them. Just like the Fayum portraits of ancient Egypt allowed the dead to dwell among the living, we are moments away from living in that episode of Black Mirror. Services like Eternity already suggest you can treat their algorithm, uh, train their algorithm to write like you. And once you die, which now takes the form of you not answering your weekly emails from the service twice, you will be right back. The algorithm will pick up from where you left off. People online won't even know your body is literally out of the picture. Whether a simple algorithm or a pricey hologram, our stories and styles are now remixed and generated to, to create more of the same performances of us. Mainstream examples range from dead musicians that are still performing, like Tupac Shakur and Michael Jackson, to Holocaust survivors who will soon not be among us in flesh, but will still be able to tell their stories in first person to new audiences. And if you don't know this project of um, uh, UCLA, I think, let's see a minute of how this looks like. My name is Pinhas Guta. I will answer any questions you might have for me. How old were you when the war ended? I was between the ages of 13 and 14 when the war ended in 1945. Do you remember any songs from your youth? This is an alibi that my mother used to sing to me and I still remember it. It's in Polish. Yeah. So this is the new memory. We already have graves with QR codes that give you a peek into the deceased's memories. 
It won't be long till we walk through a graveyard and a colorful holographic ghost will be jumping from every grave like in a Harry Potter movie, introducing themselves cheerfully and offering the secrets to their famous cookie recipe. In a world that doesn't believe in a soul anymore, we're eager to leave behind information, but not in the traditional sense of ideas that live on through books. The media of the times obscures and erases its own materiality to blur the boundaries between the dead and the living, memory and identity, which are all perceived as information patterns within cybernetic systems. Perhaps the only differences now lie with the nature of the animating agent. As a result, there is a current debate in anthropology to what extent the metaphor of performance remains relevant for understanding identity in the digital age. Terry Silvio suggests we use the metaphor of animation, which no longer assumes one embodied actor behind each persona. According to media, media philosopher Friedrich Kittler, the very concept of media is disappearing these days, and only one medium of a dubious ontology is left, for code. And if media are indeed disappearing, does this mean they have succeeded in their original mission of capturing and connecting our souls in a hive mind digital realm of telepathic communication? Or have they merely managed to relieve us of the burden of memory altogether, externalize enough of our interiors and scatter them across time and space, severing their connection with our bodies, leaving us stranded, staring at our screens like zombies, while these desperate messages that are us fall short of reaching other empty vessels in a state that internet psychologist Cherry Turkle refers to as alone together.